If you live each day as if it was your last, someday you'll most certainly be right. Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Remembering that you are going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. One of the most influential people in my life that is not a saint is Steve Jobs. In this video, I'm gonna share with you five lessons from his life from a Catholic perspective that I think will benefit your soul and will help the church in her mission of evangelization. Now, disclaimer, I know some of you immediately who know Steve Jobs are gonna say, this man wasn't Catholic, this man was full of vices, this guy was petty, this guy was harsh, this guy was rude, I get it. But when I turn my computer on and when I edit a video, I am thankful on a regular basis for the difference that Steve Jobs made in the world. On top of that, he inspired me when I needed to be inspired when nobody in the church would inspire me. So I hope that by sharing with you these lessons and then adding to it the Catholic perspective that I heard these lessons from, that you're gonna be greatly enriched and that you're gonna be inspired. So let's get started. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is. Your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much. That's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and push in, something will pop out the other side. You can change it. You can mold it. That's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this erroneous notion that life is there and you're just going to live in it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. And however you learn that, once you learn it, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. This is a huge lesson that life is made up of people who are no smarter than you. But even in the church, the church is made up of people who are no smarter than you. The church is made up of people who are no holier than you. So question everything. The things that we do in the church that are not doctrine, that are not dogma, that are practice. Ask the question of yourself, why do I do that? question everything. Just because somebody wears a collar, just because somebody's holding a microphone, just because somebody is on YouTube, one, doesn't make them right. Two, it doesn't make them better than you. Anybody can do this. But let's go to Steve's second point. You can change it. When you realize that you can impact souls if you simply do the work, if you're willing to do the work. So whatever you're not happy with, if you don't like Catholic education, Get involved in Catholic education. You can change it. If you don't like the standards for modesty, you can change it. Your work will have an impact on other people. If you don't like the quality of priests that are coming out of our seminaries, you can change that. The church is very open to being changed, but you have to be willing to do the work. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference. Lesson number two comes from a commencement address that Steve gave at Stanford. This was in 2005. I encourage you, watch the entire commencement address. It's very Catholic. If I could, I would just play this entire commencement address from beginning to end. I'm only gonna focus on one part, but he makes three points. The first point he talks about connecting the dots of your past, following that, that drive you have inside of you, uh, having confidence that it's gonna work out, what he's really talking about on a spiritual level, he just doesn't know it, is divine providence, trusting the voice of God that speaks in your soul. He concludes this great commencement address with a message about death, very Catholic message. But what I wanna focus on is the second part, the middle part of that commencement address. Let's check it out. My second story is about love and loss. I was lucky. 
I found what I love to do early in life. Waz and I started Apple in my parents' garage when I was 20. We worked hard, and in 10 years, Apple had grown from just the two of us in a garage into a $2 billion company with over 4,000 employees. We just released our finest creation, the Macintosh, a year earlier, and I just turned 30. And then I got fired. And so at 30, I was out, and very publicly out. What had been the focus of my entire adult life was gone, and it was devastating. I really didn't know what to do for a few months. I felt that I had let the previous generation of entrepreneurs down, that I had dropped the baton as it was being passed to me. I was a very public failure, and I even thought about running away from the valley. But something slowly began to dawn on me. I still loved what I did. The turn of events at Apple had not changed that one bit. I'd been rejected, but I was still in love. And so I decided to start over. I didn't see it then, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. The heaviness of being successful was replaced by the lightness of being a beginner again, less sure about everything. It freed me to enter one of the most creative periods of my life. During the next five years, I started a company named Next, another company named Pixar, and fell in love with an amazing woman who would become my wife. In a remarkable turn of events, Apple bought Next, and I returned to Apple, and the technology we developed at Next is at the heart of Apple's current renaissance. And Lorene and I have a wonderful family together. I'm pretty sure none of this would have happened if I hadn't been fired from Apple. It was awful tasting medicine, but I guess the patient needed it. Everybody is going to experience tragedy. When I got out of college, I wanted to change young people's lives, so I became a religion teacher at a great Catholic school. I had a great principal, and my pastor is a very good man. But our views of where the church should go differed. The pastor's vision is the pastor's vision. It was either I change what I believe to be true, or I have to leave. And so I had to leave. And that was very devastating for me personally, because I loved to teach and I felt like I was letting my students down. Now looking back, that was the best thing that could have ever happened to me because now I can spend my time educating people all over the world in what I believe to be God's vision for the church. Nobody likes humiliations, but the virtue of humility is absolutely necessary, not only to be happy and holy, but to be truly successful. Humility provides us with an emotional freedom so that when we fail, it can actually position us to do greater things. Sometimes life's gonna hit you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. You've got to find what you love. Your work is gonna fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And like any great relationship, it just gets better and better as the years roll on. So keep looking, don't settle. The third lesson, this is concerning Steve's personal life and his eating habits. At the age of 19, Steve went to India to study Eastern religions. And when he came back, he began to fast rigorously. Steve Jobs fasted at least two days out of the week. Sometimes he would go an entire week without eating. And he meditated on a daily basis. Every single serious major world religion, Buddhism, fasting, Hinduism, fasting, Islam, fasting, Catholicism, where's our fasting? If you read in the Acts of the Apostles, as they're preparing themselves for mission to be full of the Holy Spirit, the apostolic church spends days in fasting. The medieval church, long fasts. The modern church, no fasting. One meal and two snacks that don't equal a full meal twice a year. That's not fasting. That's a normal diet for many people across the world. There is no fasting in the church and we need to regain it. Now, Steve Jobs would fast. Why would he fast? He would fast for a lot of practical, worldly reasons. He would fast because he wanted self-control. He wanted to regulate his body. He liked that power. He would fast for the feeling of euphoria, for that heightened intellectual capacity. 
because we have our faith, we realize that there's more to fasting than just self-control. Self-control, controlling the passions, absolutely necessary. But the Holy Spirit came down with more power upon St. Paul, upon Barnabas, because they first engaged in fasting. Many of our loved ones are on the highway to hell and we need to make reparation for them. On top of that, it calls down the mercy of God. So it's important that we have something in our life that has to do with our bodily appetites that we are restricting on a regular basis. I have a video dedicated to how to fast in a healthy and nutritional way. The second thing that Steve did on a daily basis, he would meditate. Now he would do Eastern meditation, trying to settle the monkey brain, trying to become more in tune with his intuition. What I encourage you to do is sit in the presence of God himself, face to face. Who can enlighten your intuition? Who can guide your thoughts? Who can guide you in your choices more than Jesus Christ? Real, authentic, contemplative prayer. At the very least, you can spend 15 minutes meditating upon the presence of Christ in the Most Holy Eucharist. This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. Lesson number four, I'm not gonna tell you what it is yet. I'm gonna show you a couple clips. Let's see if you notice them. Well, first of all, one's very fortunate if you get to work on just one of these in your career. 1984, we introduced the Macintosh. It didn't just change Apple, it changed the whole computer industry. <laughs> In 2001, we introduced the first iPod. It changed the entire music industry. Today, we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod a phone, and an internet communicator, an iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. Based on those clips, did you pick up what lesson number four is? When Steve Jobs gave a presentation, he did use PowerPoint, but you know what he didn't do? His PowerPoint wasn't filled with words. He didn't read his PowerPoint. His PowerPoint was there to aid in his presentation. This is very practical for the church at large. If you're gonna give a presentation, make it beautiful. Number two, be prepared. You should not have to read your message. What is more important, the delivery of the iPhone or a presentation on the Holy Eucharist? How come he can prepare for a worldly good and I can't prepare for eternal goods? And the third thing that I hope you noticed. There's an old Wayne Gretzky quote that I love. I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. And we've always tried to do that at Apple since the very, very beginning and we always will. He spoke with conviction. Convicted people convict people. And I should be able to speak from the heart. What is this man willing to do for worldly things and what am I willing to do for God? Prepare, speak from the heart. I have a video on how to speak with the power of the Holy Spirit. I will link that in the description. And finally, lesson number five. All of us use laptops, and smartphones now. Is there room for a third category of device in the middle? Something that's between a laptop and a smartphone. And we'd like to show it to you today for the first time. And we call it the iPad. So this man did a lot to have screens in every major aspect of our life. And if it wasn't for screens, you and I wouldn't be communicating. But when he was asked by an interviewer, so I bet your kids love the iPad. Do you know what Steve Jobs' response was? Oh, they've never used the iPad. What? We limit technology in the home. He wanted to limit the outside access that the world had to corrupt his children and to have them become blind sheep. 
I would be a hypocrite if I sat here and told you that my kids don't look at a screen. My kids look at screens, but I know exactly what my children are looking at. He didn't shy away from this comment when he was being interviewed. We too should have the boldness not to care what other people think about how we raise our kids because these are first and foremost our kids. I am a youth minister and I see on a regular basis good kids who come from good families, who've completely gone off the deep end, and the parents don't know why. What I am trying to inculcate in them has been lost because what is sneaking into the home behind a device. So be very, very cautious what enters the home. If the devil can't enter through the front door, he's going to enter in through your device. And especially the men of the family, you have to say no. And if you don't have children and you're considering getting married and having your own family, you need to have a plan so that the device does not become a downfall for our children. These are tools. They can be very good, but we have to be on guard. We look to the saints to give us our greatest inspiration, but I can't deny Steve Jobs inspires me. And he provided the tools necessary to do what I love to do. I want to conclude this video by taking a commercial that Steve Jobs made and putting my own Catholic twist. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes. The ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do.